The Buddha would often begin his Dharma talks by saying, listen and pay careful attention. Now by that he didn't mean listen to every word. He also meant listen using appropriate attention. He never taught bare attention. As far as he, were concern <clears throat> as far as he was concerned, there were only two types of attention, appropriate and inappropriate. And appropriate attention is something you want to bring to the Dharma as you listen to it. It means asking the right questions. How does this Dharma apply to my behavior? How does it apply to my mind right now? Particularly with regard to things I might do well to abandon and things I might do well to develop, both in outside behavior and in what's going on in the mind. Because appropriate attention reminds you, this is all about understanding, comprehending suffering and the causes of suffering, so that you can bring an end to it. An appropriate attention basically asks two kinds of questions with regard to your behavior in general. What's skillful and should be developed, and what's unskillful that should be abandoned. As you get into the mind. Where is the suffering right now? What am I clinging to? How am I clinging to it? And where is the cause? What's the craving that's giving rise to this? And what should I develop in the mind so I can get rid of that craving, abandon it? Now, when you listen to the Dharma talk in this way, sometimes you find that there's nothing in the Dharma talk that's related to what's going on in your mind, maybe for other people with other problems. So you just let it pass. This is why the Ajahns would often say, don't listen to the Dharma talk. Don't give your main attention to the Dharma talk. Give your main attention to what's going on in your mind as you meditate. Maybe 5% of your attention to the talk. But if there's something that's going to be relevant to what you're doing as you're meditating, that will come in on its own. They talk about how a John Mun would give long Dharma talks, and almost every one of them would start with very basic principles in the practice and then work up to more refined principles, with the idea that each level of the talk would be appropriate for somebody in the audience. And so you'd sit there, focused on your breath, focused on your meditation, and then he'd get to where you were in your path, and then he'd move on. So that's what you were listening for, that part where he was talking about what's going on in your mind right now. And the rest you just leave for others. while you're listening to the part that is appropriate to you, ask yourself, what am I doing right now that's re relevant to what's being said? When there's a discussion of unskillful mental states, do I have those mental states right now? When there's a discussion of skillful ones, do I have those right now? Maybe the discussion will give me some ideas. Now I can abandon what's unskillful, develop what's skillful. That's listening to the Dharma talk in the right way. Now the Buddhist descriptions of how you would listen give some useful indications about how the practice of concentration is related to listening. On the one hand, he says you not only bring appropriate attention, but you also bring a quality that he calls ekaka. Your mind should be ekaka which means it's gathered into one around the topic of the talk. You're not split off thinking about other things, tomorrow's issues or yesterday's issues. You're focused on what the talk is saying. Your mind is gathered around right here. Now this point helps to explain 
that when the mind is in right concentration, it's also said to be eka, which sometimes people say means one-pointed, so one-pointed at the point that you're not even aware of your body. You're not aware of sounds. But if that were so, then you wouldn't be able to listen to the Dharma talk. You wouldn't be able to think thoughts of appropriate attention. Because appropriate attention involves directed thought and evaluation, which are qualities of the first jhana. You have your thoughts flow along with the talk, and you evaluate what's being said as it relates to what's going on in your mind. That's what the appropriate attention is for. So this clears up that issue. Egaka or egagata, the, the noun form, doesn't mean one-pointedness. It means gathered into one. You can still hear. You can still be aware of your body. You can still know what's going on in your mind. And you're in a position where you can do something about it. That's one point. Another point the Buddha talks about how you get the mind into concentration by listening to a Dharma talk. Sometimes people say, how can jhana be necessary for awakening if people can gain awakening while they're listening to the Dharma talk? We have lots of examples in the canon. Well, the Buddha explains, you listen to the Dharma, and you gain a sense of the Dharma. You're sensitive to the Dharma, you're sensitive to its meaning. In other words, you see how it applies to what's going on in your mind right now. You actually follow along. Something that's said to be abandoned, you try abandoning it. Something to be developed, you develop, and you begin to see the results. As I would have said, a sense of joy comes from that. From that joy, there's rapture. From the rapture, your body is calmed. When the body is calmed, there's a sense of pleasure. And that sense of pleasure then becomes the basis for getting the mind centered. So in a case like that, you've listened enough to the talk to realize what, how it's useful for you. And you see the results. That brings the mind into concentration. So listening to a Dharma talk doesn't preclude getting the mind into concentration. In fact, if you listen to, to the talk well, and the talk is relevant to what's going on in your mind, it can naturally lead to concentration. And then from concentration, as the mind is really centered, you can develop more discernment. That leads to release. There are lots of cases in the canon of people gaining the Dharma eye as they listen to the talk by the Buddha, and it's ex expressed the same way again and again. Whatever is subject to or origination is all subject to cessation. Now taken on its own, it sounds simply like a, a generalization about the fact of inconstancy. But you have to ask, in what kind of mental state would that observation arise naturally without having been told? Because in all the cases in the canon, nobody's been told ahead of time what the Dharma is going to be. There's one passage where, after Sariputta at that point was not yet ordained, has gained the Dharma by listening to a very short talk by Asaji one of the five brethren. He comes back to see his friend Moggallana. Moggallana sees him coming from afar, and he says, Your faculties are bright. Your eyes are clear. Have you seen the deathless? And Sariputta says, Yes. So that's the key, seeing the deathless. You work with the fabrications in your mind. Get them really subtle. maintaining whatever quality of concentration you've got. And then when discernment arises, you begin to see even the concentration is fabricated. 
So the next question is, what do, where do you go to re reduce the stress even in the fab fabricated concentration? And you realize wherever else you could go was also a fabrication. And there comes an insight. The mind can either go here, stay here, or go there. And it sees something that's an alternative. The alternative is totally unfabricated. That's the experience of the deathless. And one of the things you realize as you come back from that experience, so you've stepped out of outside of everything that is subject to origination. That thing you you realized that is not subject to origination. It's also not subject to cessation. Everything else that's originated would be. So it's not just a general statement based on ordinary everyday experience. It's a realization that comes from something that's extraordinary. So there is this possibility. Listening to the Dharma talk, it can take you to something extraordinary. As you follow along, see how it applies to what you're doing in your mind right now. Apply the teachings. And then head the mind toward disenchantment, dispassion. And this can happen while you're listening to Dharma talk. And as the Buddha said, it doesn't have to come from the Buddha himself. It can come from someone else who is practicing the path. It can come while you're reflecting on the Dharma, it, even while you're teaching the Dharma yourself. There have been cases of people giving Dharma talks and gaining awakening while they give the talk. There's one mentioned in the canon, a monk who's sick, and the other monks are concerned about him. He's sick, he may die. So they ask him about his attainment. And there's a series of questions going back and forth. And they ask him if he, after he's said some pretty remarkable things about his attainments, they ask him, well, are you an arhat? And he says, no, not yet. Well, what's, what are you still holding on to? And as he's explaining what he's still holding on to, he gains full awakening. So that can happen too. You reflect on the Dharma, you teach the Dharma, even reciting the Dharma. Back in those days, they were reciting in their own native language. In all these cases, the Buddha says, these are possibilities for an opening to release, in addition to simply meditating, getting the mind into concentration on its own. There are other ways of inducing a state of concentration through joy in the Dharma. So when you're listening to the Dharma, try to listen in a way that would give rise to a sense of joy. Joy in the excellence of the Dharma. Why is the Dharma excellent? Because you apply it while it's being taught, and you see results. That, the Buddha said, is the miracle of instruction. Someone once asked him to show a few miracles to get more adherence, and he says, well, people will always be dubious. You read their minds, they wonder if there's some trick. You display psychic powers, they wonder if there's some trick. But if you teach them something that when they put it into practice, actually gets results, then no, there's no trick. This is the real deal. You know for sure that the teaching is true because you've truly put it into practice. So learn how to listen to the Dharma properly, with appropriate attention. And remember that appropriate attention, especially as it applies to the Four Noble Truths, carries some duties. When the talk points out something should be abandoned, you actually try to abandon it. When it points out something should be developed, you try to develop it. And in the Buddhist terms, you, you get sensitive to 
what the talk is aiming at. You get sensitive to the Dharma. And that's what gives rise to the joy that later becomes one of the causes for concentration. And the concentration becomes, can become a condition for further insight. This means, of course, that you approach the Dharma with some right view. It's all very basic right view, the conviction that you're here to train the mind, because the mind can be trained, and it will make a difference in your actions, and your actions will make a difference in your life. And the Dharma that's being taught can be applicable to what's going on in your mind right now, what you're doing in the mind right now. And you're in a position where you can test it. If you believe that much, you're ready to listen to the Dharma in a way where you can really benefit. <laughs>